I'm from upstate New York. It's cloudy, it's snowy, and I was at home in New York State watching you guys go through the book. And uh, a number of times I was just so eager to jump in in the Q&A time because you guys asked excellent questions. And I was like, oh, I, I think I have a good answer for that. And so now I'm glad that we can finally have this opportunity. So thank you, Dr. Geem, for inviting me here. Thank you for uh, going through the book for that many weeks. Um, it's a blessing. So Dr. Sanford and I published the book Contested Bones in the final quarter of 2017. We have since updated it, and I just sent it to the printer uh, yesterday, so we'll have new books available in a few weeks. So if you have Contested Bones already, I'm happy to give you our updated version, uh, free uh, courtesy of Feed My Sheep Foundation. So just at the end of this talk, if you want the updated version, just come up here, give me your address, and we can get that to you in about two to three weeks. So real quick, I'm going to uh, hit the high level on the 2019 updates. We can get into more detail uh, later on if you'd like, or you can just uh, grab the latest version. So for those who've been following along with the book, this will make more sense to you. So 2018, there was a Proceedings of the National Academy of Science article and provides additional support for our alternative model of human genetic degeneration in small subpopulations. And we came to that conclusion even before we found five recently published papers by the time we published the book. And so that helped support our model. And then two, we document additional evidence for the coexistence of anatomically modern humans during the time of Lucy's kind, Australopithecus afarensis. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit today. And three, we're going to cite further evidence confirming the fully human status uh, I'm sorry, this is the update. We have, we've cited further evidence confirming the full human status of Homo naledi and Homo floresiensis. Homo floresiensis is nicknamed Hobbit from the island of Flores, if that uh, rings a bell. And four, uh, we also add an index of topics. Uh, a number of people said they wished they had that so they can look things up a little quicker. So we now have that for you. So I want to be thorough, though, and make sure that we're all on the same page, because some people might have missed the series. And so I'm going to go through the main themes of our findings. And, and so I think that this will be helpful to have, for us to all have clarity, and maybe you can ask questions at the end if you'd like. We're going to have time for maybe five of these today. So the first theme, the first major finding that we found is that we are now witnessing the collapse of the traditional ape to man story that has been uh, taught and promoted widely throughout the world since the mid-1970s to the present. And so you guys have probably seen the image I just showed you of the, the iconic ape parade. That was first published in uh, Early Man, a book that was uh, released in 1965. And we've seen all kinds of different forms of this in the internet and all over the place. And the idea here is that there's a smooth progression from the earliest ape-like creatures, like the Australopiths, going all the way into the genus Homo and into modern humans. And so this is uh, claimed to be based upon fossil evidence. And of course, we now know that that's simply not true. It was never true to begin with. Even in the book, they acknowledged that it's not based on actual fossil evidence. So it's always been just an illustration. Here's Meredith Small from Cornell University. She gives us a glimpse of what the hominid fossil record actually shows. And although this is a very contested field, it's very rare to find paleo experts agree on most anything. But in this um, specific uh, idea, they all pretty much agree. And so she says, for anthropology students 30 years ago, learning human evolution was a breeze. It went from Australopithecus to Homo habilis to Homo erectus to various Homo sapiens. It was a straight shot that one could learn in a few minutes late at night while cramming for an exam. But in the, 19, but in the late 1970s, we entered a golden age of human fossil discoveries that has repeatedly punched holes in this naive idea that our evolution would be clear, clean, and straight. Like most animals, humans have a checkered past. And our family album is now full of side branches and dead ends. The straight line has blossomed into a spreading, rather uncontrolled bush, and we don't like it. We want our history to be nice and neat, but the fossils keep messing us up. We want the last 200,000 years of human evolution 
um, the time when modern homo sapiens appeared to make some kind of sense, but it doesn't. And here's another quote. I could show you a number of quotes that we've also documented in the book. Here's from an expert uh, reporting in the Journal of Nature. Um, so <laughs> the popular fresco showing a single file of marching hominids becoming ever more vertical, tall, and hairless now appears to be fiction. And here we have Bernard Wood, who is a, a, a well-known and a, a prominent member of the paleo community from George Washington University. Um, and he says there's a popular image of human evolution that you'll find all over the place. On the left of the picture, there's an ape. On the right, a man. Between the two is a succession of figures that become ever more like humans. Our progress from ape to human looks so smooth, so tidy. It's such a beguiling image that even the experts are loath to let it go. But it is an illusion. So what does the true uh, history of our origins look like according to experts in the field? Well, it's not a smooth, tidy, straight line like they parade. Instead, they almost, they almost unanimously describe it as a messy, tangled bush. And they use those words, messy and tangled, very often. And so as you find more and more of these fossils, and if you're a taxonomic splitter, those are those who like to make new species out of every little minute difference in the bones. And so as you add more and more species to the tree, it becomes a bush. And so it becomes more branching, it becomes more branching and more uncontrolled. And that's a problem, actually, because now most experts in the field are acknowledging that we cannot discern an ape-to-man progression in the fossil record at all. And you've probably seen this when you went through the book. And I've heard someone say in the Q&A time that made me chuckle that it looks like the branches are levitating, like they're floating. <laughs> and that wasn't by mistake. This was done by Bernard Wood. He is an expert in human phylogenetic trees. So he is more qualified than most in his field to make the confession I'll show you in a moment. But this was not done on, uh, by accident. He shows, for example, those that are colored yellow, if you'll notice, those are the Australopiths. None of them are connected to the homo group in blue. And so there is no Australopith to man progression, and many admit that and acknowledge this. So here's Bernard Wood, Nature News. He says, even with all the fossil evidence and analytical techniques from the past 50 years, a convincing hypothesis for the origin of homo, which means humans, remains elusive. And that is the primary purpose of the theory from the beginning since the time of Darwin, is to find out where humans originated from. And that is what they still have not been able to do, despite 150 years of cataloging thousands of hominid fossils. Now, I've often heard skeptics say uh, that, you know, that's just because we need more fossil evidence. But actually, the reverse is happening. We're not having more clarity as we find more fossils, but less clarity, more confusion. And so here's from a journal published in the Proceedings National Academy of Science by the current curator of the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. And he, ex he answers his own question that he asks in the title of his paper. And he says, the Pliocene hominid diversity conundrum, do more fossils mean less clarity? And he says, yes, the more we find of these fossils, the more they do not fit into, this, into the, the most basic assumptions of the ape to man story. It's just not fitting in a way that suggests we evolved from early Australopiths over a period of, of around six million years to the present. So here are some more uh, quotes from experts in the field, and I document these in the book so, uh, you, can, so you can tell that I'm not just making this up. <laughs> and so this is a paleo expert says, all new discoveries make things more confusing. Donald Johansson, discoverer of Lucy, says, the transition to Homo continues to be almost totally confusing. And John Hawkes, Another prominent member says, what, is, what a mess early homo is. And here's from Schwartz and Tattersall. Again, these are well-known experts in the field. Uh, the journal Science, they're acknowledging. They say, if we want to be objective, we shall most certainly have to scrap the iconic list of names in which hominid fossil specimens have historically been trapped. So all those names we see, like Homo habilis, Homo erectus, he's basically saying we need to scrap many of those names and start from the beginning. So he says that. He says we need to start from the beginning by hypothesizing morphs, building testable theories of relatedness, and rethinking genera and species. This is one of the most profound quotes we've found. He's essentially saying we can scrap much of the research we've done, or at least we need to reinterpret those findings. The third major theme that we found was that we're seeing a clear separation between the ape type, which they call Australopithecus, and the human type, Homo. And this, as you would expect, this is a very natural biblical prediction, right? We would expect if God created Adam and Eve, and on the same day he created uh, apes and a diversity of apes, perhaps, 
we would expect that they would be quite separate and distinct because one did not evolve gradually into the other. And so here we have expert in the field saying, no doubt about it, Australopithecines are like apes, and the Homo group are like humans. And I want to qualify that because I do not believe, based on the research we've done, that Australopithecus is a pure hypodime or a pure uh, genera. What I mean by that is I believe there are a number of human bones, anatomically modern human bones, that have been misclassified as Australopithecus. But in general, most of the bones, you can say, are probably going to be ape. And we'll talk about some evidence that there's been some mixing. Okay, but that's an interesting point she's making. There are two distinct types, the ape type and the human type. Now, that doesn't mean that there's not variation, right? We know that there are lots of variation in modern human skeletons, people living today. And so you can imagine that we also would expect that in the fossil record. Nevertheless, even accounting for the variation, we still see that you can separate them out. And you can do that whenever you find the, the specimens well-preserved. So if you find a complete um, limb bone and it has the diagnostic aspects uh, preserved, such as the distal end or the proximal end, you can actually tell, yes, this is an ape or this is a human. However, when you have very fragmentary remains that are not clearly associated with more bones, then obviously that gets more complicated. But the point is that whenever you find intact, well-preserved specimens, it's very easy to separate them out, human or ape. And so let me just give you an example. Um, Turconoboy. Turconoboy was attributed to the species Homo erectus. And by the way, Homo erectus is, is experts in the field who are called lumpers would say they, are, they should be just considered Homo sapiens. Okay, they say the differences have been exaggerated. So think about Turconoboy. It's attributed to Homo erectus. We find 90% of its skeleton, I'm guesstimating here. And interestingly enough, since it's a very complete skeleton, you can clearly tell what it is. I'll show you a picture later on. Neanderthals, we have about 500 uh, uh, different Neanderthal sites, so we have many specimens of Neanderthals. And we've, able, we've been able to co uh, uh, compile a composite skeleton. So for all practical purposes, we have the complete skeleton of Neanderthals. We know what they look like. And, un and contrary to early claims, Neanderthal appears to be fully human anatomically. And so, we now, and so it's interesting, we have clarity whenever we have the well-preserved specimens. But now considered the, the fossils that have been proclaimed as missing links, like Artie, or Lucy, or Setaba, or Hablis, you'll notice that all of these so-called missing links that are still proclaimed as missing links in textbooks are oftentimes very fragmentary. And I think that's interesting because that's when you can in invoke more uh, speculation and artistic license in the reconstructions and in the interpretations. So let's consider Artie. Artie is about uh, a skeleton found in Ethiopia. It's 45% complete. But when Tim White discovered these remains in the early 90s, about 1994, he described them as roadkill. They were pulverized. In fact, the skull, was, he said it was pancaked and crushed down to four centimeters in height, broken into 100 pieces. He joked, it's almost like a rhinoceros had stepped on it and crushed it. And so these bones that they're finding, it took them 17 years to reconstruct the Artie skeleton. And the reason why it took so long is because they couldn't even reconstruct it physically. The bones were so fragile. They were dispersed over, over a span of a mile, over a mile. And so they had to do it recon digitally reconstruct it. They couldn't be sure they were even the same species, despite their claim that they had found a missing link in the oldest human ancestor. And Lucy, uh, Johansson claims that it's 40% complete. Well, actually, if you count the missing bones of the hands and feet as you should, Lucy is actually only 20% complete. And the bones were found eroding out of the hillside in 1974 in a far region of Ethiopia. And he noticed that many of these bones were just scattered and jumbled. He said if it was another rainstorm, they would have washed off the cliff. And he assumed they were all belonged to a single species. But we can be skeptical of that because he had to screen about 20 tons of sediment over, over an area of 50 square meters. And it turns out that um, they accidentally included a baboon bone in the skeleton. It's been on display for decades until just in 2015 they realized we have a bone that does not belong to this skeleton. And so I wonder, and I am skeptical, and I'll reserve my judgments for now until we get a publication, that there might be other bones that do not belong to Lucy's skeleton. And now Setaba, same thing. They found Setaba in a pit with thousands of bones of all kinds of different African fauna, 34% complete for one skeleton and 46% complete for the other. And so there was some confusion as to whether or not all the bones belong. And lo and behold, experts now say, some experts say it's actually a mixture of human and ape bones. Hablis, the same thing. It's less than 20% complete. It's, and I'll show you a picture in a moment. But notice that the missing links 
are generally consistently very fragmentary, very poorly preserved. Why is it that we don't see the missing links of very complete skeletons? Or if we do, um, uh, oftentimes they're in mixed bone beds. And it's okay, so here's a picture of Turkana boy, which is clearly human. And even the Bishop of Kenya says that he wants the skeleton back to give it a proper burial instead of putting it in the museum. And so uh, experts are now pretty surprised since 1984 was discovered. They say it looks like Homo erectus is much more human than we ever imagined. And so here's on the right, though, is a missing link. It uh, belongs to Homo habilis. But if you noticed, uh, look how fragmentary the missing link is. OK. The next major theme we found is that th we, we are observing, we are finding that there is an extensive coexistence of the Australopith type with man. That's really interesting because let me just read this quote. So here's from an expert in the field who's saying, humans first evolved in Africa, in East Africa, about 2.5 million years ago, and from an earlier genus of apes called Australopithecus. So this represents the, the fundamental assumption of the ape to man story that we've been taught since the 70s to the present. And it claims that Australopithecines, like Lucy's kind, which lived about three to four million years ago, gave rise to the earliest members of the genus Homo, such as Homo habilis. And that happened around 2.5 million years ago, the, the earliest members of the genus Homo arose. And so, but now we are finding a lot of evidence, mounting evidence, that anatomically modern human bones are being found in the deepest layers where we find the earliest Australopiths. So that calls into question the fundamental assumption of the ape to man story that is currently being taught all around even the world. And so has this claim, though, been confirmed by the fossil record. And so, I, as I just said, um, we're seeing a reversal of that, of this story. So here is just some evidence. In the 1970s, which is considered the golden decade of paleoanthropology research, that time, that time period in history was instrumental for giving rise to the modern theory. And so at these three major East African sites in Kenya, in, um, in, Kenya, in Ethiopia, and in, and in uh, Tanzania, they found numerous uh, thousands of butchered bones, a diversity of stone tools, human footprints, human bones, a windbreak shelter in Aldivai, commun communal centers and living sites. So they found extensive evidence of human culture and human behavior, and even humans buried with Australopiths. And that's interesting. So if, we, if Australopiths gave rise to modern humans, why are, we f why are they found buried together? So here's famous paleoanthropologist Richard Leakey. He comments on this finding, and he says, I see no reason that bands of Homo would not have killed and eaten robust Australopithecines when they could, just as they killed and ate antelopes and other prey animals. And indeed, they find these sites, and they call them living sites. They're effectively like campsites, where they would butcher remains, they would eat them, they would apparently, uh, experts even said it, it appears that they have normal human social behavior. And so they're picture nomadic tribes that are simply hunting and eating these, these animals. And Richard Leakey, in Nature, in 1971, he says, there seems no evidence, however, and by the way, his views haven't, varied, haven't changed much since then. I've uh, been able to talk to him recently. He says, there seems no evidence, however, that the genus Homo at Rudolph, which is East Turkana, um, had any direct relationship to the Australopithecine population of the same time with which it shared its habitat. The concept of gracile, which means uh, lightly built, Australopithecine being ancestral to Homo, and the lower Pleistocene, requires careful re-examination. The Lake Turkana material, or East Turkana material, seems to confirm the view developed as a result of work at Aldivai Gorge, that's Tanzania, that Homo and Australopithecus are two quite separate and distinct early Pleistocene hominins. So what is he saying here? He's saying that the Australopiths did not give rise to the genus Homo, but they were two distinct parallel lineages. They coexisted, and they don't have a relationship with each other. He believed that the common ancestor would be much earlier. We still haven't found it around four to six million years ago. We still haven't found that common ancestor. So his view, in a way, uh, is somewhat reminiscent of the biblical perspective where we see Australopith and man coexisting. Okay. Now here's the interesting history that I want to share with you. So are we finding these types of evidences, like stone tools, human bones, and so forth, dating even to the time of Lucy's kind, three or four million years ago, which is prior to the origin of the genus Homo? You can understand why that would be a problem, right? So are we finding examples of that? Well, we are. And they were described by none other, none other than even Donald Johansson himself. In the 1970s, Anna Leakey's, Mary Leakey and Richard Leakey. So they found human limb bones, 
human jaw bones, human hands, human foot bones, human footprints. And by the way, they didn't just refer to these as just, in general, the homotype, because that can be pretty broad according to their definition. They would actually describe them as indistinguishable from modern homo sapiens, even homo sapiens. And so this is an interesting bit of history that I'm discussing here. So what happened? And Well, in 1976, Donald Johansson and his colleague even reported in the journal Nature that they're finding evidence, and I, you probably can't read it here, it's small, but he's showing that we find clear evidence for the coexistence of Australopithecus and Homo. Of course, that's not the model that's taught today, is it? Because today they teach that no one gave rise to the other. So what happened? Well, Johansson decided to change, he changed his mind completely. He was influenced by Tim White, who was an expert in the field who believed that you can't have more than one hominid species living in the same area of East Africa during the time period of three to four million years ago. It was called this, the, the, one sing, the, the single species hypothesis. So, so he believed uh, all of those bones had to belong to just one type, not Homo and Australopith. And so Johansson was eventually convinced of his model. He changed his mind. And so let me just reiterate uh, what I'm saying. He says, so the, this is what I'm writing. So current model was proposed, the current model that we're now taught um, was, was popularized in the late 70s by John L. Johansson and Tim White, who claimed that all members of the genus Homo descended from Lucy's kind and that the origin of the genus Homo aro arose about 2 to 2.5 million years ago. Therefore, according to this popularized model today that is still taught, no anatomically modern human fossils or stone tools should be found buried together with Lucy's kind 3 to 4 million years ago. Except the problem is, Donald Johansson just described numerous bones as just looking just like modern Homo sapiens. So he was stuck. And he said, oops, I was wrong. I made a mistake. And it was just a preliminary assessment. And so he changed the story. And then he said, actually, all of those human bones should now be reclassified as, my, as members of my species, Australopithecus afarensis. And Lucy became famous. Johnson, Johansson became famous. And that popularized the model that we now hear, right? Australopithecus giving rise to Homo habilis and Homo erectus and so forth. OK, so this was uh, an important time in history. Um, but let's go back to that point that I just made. So what about all those human bones, though, right? What about all those, the stone tools and things like that, that, you know, things we shouldn't be finding? Well, such findings would falsify the popularized ape demand story, as I'm explaining. So here's what's happening in recent, uh, in recent uh, years. It turns out Johansson's original assessment was more accurate than, he, than, he, than we realize. <laughs> so we are now finding more and more examples of stone tools, sophisticated stone tools. So these are the type of stone tools that no living ape could ever manufacture. And we've done a, there's done a lot of experience on, uh, experiments on that. We're finding butchered bones, um, more human foot bones, more human footprints, and a partial human skeleton. And they're dating to the time of three to four million years ago. So this. These, we should consider these uh, you know, rude fossils. They're appearing where they should not appear. So here's a picture of some recent, this is 2016. Paleo experts found more footprints in Laetoli. Remember, if you went through the book, Mary Leakey discovered fossilized footprints in Tanzania in the, in the 1976, 1977, 1978. Around that time period, they found uh, thousands of, of trackways. And among them were human footprints. And so now they found more of them. And this is interesting because the new footprints I'm showing you here, uh, this is called Site S. So it's a different site. It's, it's equivalent age, the same tuff they date. It's 3.7 million years old according to conventional data methods. And if you look at those footprints, they look anatomically modern, don't they? And so, they're, in fact, they're actually pretty large. And so they would ha this individual would have had larger uh, shoe size than me. <laughs> and they describe him as chewy. It's supposedly the biggest Australopithecus on record. The problem is we've never seen an Australopith with, um, with perfectly human feet that are clearly associated or anatomically associated with a skeleton that is something that's not human. <laughs> so what's, the, what's a more reasonable interpretation? Well, the reason why these footprints look so human is simply because, no, humans did live that time, live that long ago. And um, during the time of Lucy, I mean. And here's another skeleton they found, a partial skeleton. This is found also in the far region of Ethiopia where the remains of Lucy were found. And this skeleton was nicknamed Katanumu, which means big man. And so here we have uh, large footprints and a large skeleton. And so um, 
again, this is this, and if, and if you've looked at these bones enough, when you see the skeleton, you instantly say, that's a human skeleton. And that's how experts in the field are describing big man. They say, this big man skeleton looks like a modern human skeleton. And so they're now trying to redefine how they see Australopithecus. They say Australopithecus looks much more like Homo erectus, which, as I mentioned, has a human skeleton, and Lumper say is Homo sapiens. I hope I'm uh, speak, uh, uh, making sense here. This is, so let me just move on from that. So, and I document many other examples in a book of bones that have been described by experts in the field as indistinguishable from Homo sapiens, stone tools, you know, examples like I've just showed you. So you can check the, the journals to make sure that what I'm saying is, is accurate. And, um, and I want to make one more point before we, we close. Um, I don't have time to get into all the details, but understand that the hominid timeline was established based on the potassium argon method. So it was used to calibrate the age of the fossils in East Africa, and it gave rise to the ape to man timeline that we have today. And so it was the potassium argon method that was instrumental. It was used to date a Lucy, the Lucy bones, um, the most all the bones in Hadar, in Kenya, the Latoli footprints. Um, and so it's interesting, though, that the potassium argon method is the same method that has a track record, if you look at the peer-reviewed literature, of giving dates of millions of years when testing its accuracy on rocks of known age that formed in the recent past. So, for example, we know when eruptions happened, if there's historical records or even videos or, or pictures. We know the date of the eruptions. We know when the lava flows occurred. We know when the, it crystallized and formed rock. So they should give a, a young date. They should give an accurate age. But yet they're giving dates of millions of years. And oftentimes they even fit within the ape to man time scale, which is interesting. So what's going on? Well, long story short, it, it appears that there's excess argon being trapped in the lava when it's before it crystallizes. And so it's giving the appearance, the appearance of gray age. In reality, uh, what is, what's happening is that that underlying assumption of argon degassing is false. The argon is not effectively escaping uh, the lava and is being trapped and giving the appearance of gray age. So these are just some documented examples from the peer-reviewed literature of recent eruption giving dates of millions of years. So what does that mean then? What are the implications of that? Well, to me, what that shows is that um, the entire hominid time scale is not as old as we've been taught. That actually, the reason why the footprints look so well preserved and look so human is because they were simply formed by humans in the recent past. Okay. And I want to skip number six for the sake of time. I want plenty of time for us to discuss, and I think that'll be exciting. So the last point is number seven. Um, every major claim, and this is why we titled the book Contested Bones. Because every major claim in the field is fiercely contested by leading experts. And, and so while we're taught one narrative in textbooks, in the media, um, if you look at the actual scientific journals and you read what they're saying, they can't agree on even the very fundamentals of the field. And that was quite surprising to me. I knew that there was debates, but I didn't know the debates ran so deep about every little bone and, and, and even the big picture claims. And so we are we are truly seeing that the field is in disarray. And so I just want to summarize um, some of these competing views that you're not going to hear about uh, in the media, you're not going to hear about in textbooks, yet it is oftentimes promoted by leading experts or even a large portion, if not a majority, in the field. So let's talk about Neanderthals. Um, the discoverers claims that basically since the late 1800s, um, up until just recently, with the sequencing of the Neanderthal genome and also with more uh, skeletal elements to put together the whole skeleton, We've been taught that Neanderthal is pretty much a subhuman brute and very uh, apish in certain ways and hunched over and with apish feet. That was the, the original reconstruction was, uh, was actually fraudulent and experts now acknowledge that. But the competing view by many experts in the field now, including Savante Pabo, who is the one who has spearheaded the sequence of the Neanderthal genome, says actually we have effectively shown that they have a human genome and that most of the people in this room, for example, have about 1 to 4% Neanderthal DNA in you. In you. So he says this effectively shows that they are actually Homo sapiens. And a number of experts in the field are now saying we should just reclassify them as Homo sapiens. <coughs> and that is the biblical perspective. They didn't come before Adam and Eve. They were descendants of Adam and Eve. And so they were not subhuman uh, creatures. What about Homo erectus? Same thing. We would say they are not pre-humans. They did not come before Adam and Eve, according to the biblical perspective. And Homo erectus is actually fully human 
And now, and there are experts in the field since the 70s till, the t till today who have been saying, especially since the discovery of Turkana boy, that they have a modern human skeleton. Their skulls have some unique features, but even the skulls are human and they had a cranial capacity on par with humans, not any apes. These are f totally human, and so the difference has been exaggerated, and lumpers say we should call them Homo sapiens. What's the competing view of Artie? Well, in 2009, 17 years later, after they reconstructed what they called roadkill, <laughs> and they proclaimed uh, you know, all over the media, um, headlines all over in 2009, they found the oldest human ancestor, definitely a missing link. But if you're just patient, you wait a little bit longer, a few months later, a year later, you'll see journals that come out, and have, and if you read those journals, they say, wait, we totally disagree with how they reconstructed it. There was a lot of artistic license in those digital reconstructions. They say digital reconstructions come with loads of assumptions, and actually, this looks essentially just like an extinct ape. And that's what they say. It's, it's nothing more than an extinct ape. Unfortunately, you won't see this view in textbooks. You won't see, you know, so the media gets stormed with all these headlines, but no one hears the competing view that is actually much more credible if you, if you do the, if you look carefully. And Lucy's kind, we've been told Lucy's kind, Afarensis, is definitely our ancestor. Yet ever since his, his, his reassessment in 1978, it threw the whole paleo community in turmoil. And even to the present, like Richard Leakey, um, he says that he still believes that Lucy's kind is not our ancestor, that museum displays and textbooks are wrong. He actually has told me that not long ago. And there are a number of experts in the field, even the Journal of Human Evolution, for example, where experts Schmidt and Hausler say Afarensis is a jumble of human and ape bones, Homo and Australopithecus. And lo and behold, isn't that what Johansson originally said himself in Nature in 1976? Remember when I showed you that a moment ago? So, so the competing view about Lucy's kind is that it's actually not a real species even, and it's not, or it's not our ancestor, or both, depending on who you ask. Sedaba, really quickly, uh, again, this was by Dr. Lee Berger, uh, proclaimed in 2000, and, uh, found in 2008 and proclaimed soon after to the world as the next missing link. It turns out experts are now rejecting it and has fallen to disrepute. It, the, it's dates too young. And also they say that I found experts in the field who say, no, it's actually a mixture of human and ape bones. And when I studied this creature, I came to the ca same conclusion before I even read their pa before I even read about their findings. Because I noticed this looks distinctly human. This is distinctly ape. It's found in a mixed bone bed, and I was very skeptical. And then I found even experts with a competing view agree. Homo habilis, same thing. Um, even Richard Leakey, the, the, the son of the discoverers, uh, Louis Leakey and Mary, uh, he says that this is just, uh, it's not a human ancestor. It's, there's, there's, it's basically uh, a wastebasket taxon, and it has too much anatomical variability to be a single species, and their remains are very fragmentary. So Homo habilis is more insecure as a species than ever before. And finally, Hobbit. This is uh, a human skeleton found in the Indonesian island of Flores. And um, Hobbit is proclaimed throughout the media and in textbooks to be a new species of, of human. But yet, even members of the discovery team disagreed and said, no, I think it's just a small-bodied modern human, a homo sapien. And so, interestingly enough, on the island of Flores, there are still pygmies that are living there today, not far from where it was found. What are pygmies? Pygmies are just that. They're small or dwarf humans. We find there are some in Central Africa. Obviously, they're totally human. They're homo sapiens. But the average height of a pygmy in Central Africa, for instance, is about the male is about four and a half feet tall. Uh, females are shorter. And so, interestingly enough, we still today, we find a population of small-bodied humans not far from Island of Flores. But this competing view, even though these competing views all make a lot of sense, um, we don't hear about them. And... Um, and I think those are the most credible positions. And not just because they agree with the Bible, because it truly does make the most sense. <laughs> and the exciting thing is, when we did our research, is that it does confirm the biblical perspective. There are apes, there are humans, and we don't see these transitional forms. So let me just summarize and close. The competing views are not, rare, are not merely held by rare dissidents or eccentrics. Typically, it is leading authorities in the field who are expressing dissenting views. And highly prestigious scientific journals, including Nature, Science, Journal of Human Evolution, American Journal of Physical Anthropology, Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, PLOS One, and more. Introductory level textbooks in the media have failed to present the controversy to students and the general public. This has given the public a false sense of confidence in the ape to man story. Our goal is to help people hear both sides of these controversies so they can make a better informed decision regarding the most important question of where we came from. 
concluding remarks, I want to read this uh, quote from an expert in the field. He's the current, he's a uh, emeritus curator of the American Museum of Natural History. Uh, Ian Tattersall says, even allowing for the poor record we have of our close kin, extinct kin, this is a recent quote, Homo sapiens appears as distinctive and unprecedented. There is certainly no evidence to support the notion that we gradually became who we inherently are over an extended period, either in a physical sense, meaning fossil evidence, or intellectual sense. And I've, I have a number of other quotes like this from experts in the field who will say these things. But again, have you ever seen such strong admissions in textbooks or in the media? No. It, it seems like there is, inadvertently perhaps, uh, we know this is a spiritual battle, that there is just n not much um, openness about the problems with the ape man story. And there are many. So the bottom line, we have a soul. We did not evolve from ape-like creatures over millions of years through random mutations and the reproductive filter of natural selection. <laughs> I'm a little emotional because I've worked very hard over several years. And this is why I do this. Because the world needs to know that there is a God. And we're taught all around the world. That's why I love being here at this school. We're taught all over the world that there is no God, that science disproves the Bible. But what I have found is that it's the opposite. Science dramatically confirms the plain reading of the Bible in Genesis. We just need to have um, boldness and courage to say, you know what, I'm not going to be intimidated by man's ideas. I'm going to do the hard work, do the research, and I'm gonna, at the end of the day, I'm going to say, you know what, this does make sense with a biblical view. God does exist. God is real. He is the God of the Bible. This is good news. Amen. We are all descendants of Adam and Eve. We are made in the image of God, not the image of apes. So will you help us spread the word? You already have. <laughs> you went through the book. I'm grateful for that. Uh, this talk was based on an article uh, that I have available. Dr. Sanford and I wrote it at logosra.org. And if you want to uh, get the book, I would recommend getting it at contestedbones.org. It's much cheaper than our Amazon listing. You can get the updated version in about, uh, I would wait for three weeks if you want the updated version, or just send me your address. We're happy to give you a free copy, uh, courtesy of Feed My Sheep Foundation, which is uh, headed by Dr. John Sanford. So we can be thankful to him uh, for that. And then, uh, okay, so I'm just gonna close in prayer really quick, and then we'll uh, have some question time. Hopefully we have plenty of time. Okay. Dear Lord, just thank you so much for this opportunity, Lord, to talk in front of these um, just highly intelligent people. I know it because I've heard their Q&A times and I've watched their videos. Lord, I'm just so humbled to be here. I pray this would be encouraging to everyone, that we would uh, be skeptical of man's ideas. And Lord, I pray this would be fruitful for your kingdom, that we'd uh, touch many souls with this information, the truth of your creation, and that you'd receive all glory. Amen. Okay, any questions? or discussions that you would like to put on the table? Yes. You need to get him a mic. A lot of hands up, Chris. Oh. Go ahead. Okay. Go first. Okay. <laughs> I have a, a, maybe a related quest question. Having heard this story and its credibility and what that you've done today, my question is more a personal one for you, if you're willing to share. What puts you on this road? Thanks for the question. Um, so I was a high school student. I was born in a Christian home. My parents taught me the Bible was true. God existed. Jesus rose again from the, you know, and this, the Christian story that we've been taught. And I, I thought, I never really just questioned it. I just accepted it. My parents never pushed it on me. But in high school, I noticed my friends were not... Uh, you know, my friends were obviously not Christian and they weren't following the Lord and the rubber met the road. And I realized, okay, I see why Christianity matters. It really does. If you believe it, it should affect your choices. It should affect your lifestyle, how you live your life. And that's when I realized I made the connection between Christianity and your, your choices, your life choices. And I said, well, I'm not just going to believe the Bible because my parents say so or because other people say so. Because a lot of people say it's not true. And I was conflicted about how can we really trust the Bible? And I actually remember thinking one day in school, I said, you know, if I'm just an evolved ape, I literally thought that, then, and I just evolved, and I'm just, there's no God, we're not accountable to God, we're not going to stand before him one day, then I'm going to live my life however I please. And I'm going to do whatever I want, and why, why not? <laughs> so.
So that put me on a path. I, a miracle happened. I got rid of my Xbox and PlayStation as a young man. <laughs> For an entire summer, I just researched creation, evolution, and the Bible. And I came away blown away by all this evidence and findings that I had never heard before. And so I devoted my life to the Lord, and I went to college. And in college, I was witnessing. I noticed everyone seemed to have the same types of questions about, well, how do you know the Bible is true? And a lot of the questions had to do with Genesis and origins. And I got questions about ape to man evolution a lot, too. <laughs> at that point, I wasn't very good at giving answers. But I improved over the years as I learned more information. And, and so it's pretty, pretty amazing and pretty interesting that the Lord brought that full circle and had me write a book uh, maybe 10 years later or whatnot. So I'm just, so it's very personal to me because I was one of those people where I'm not just going to believe it because it, it sounds nice or pleasant. I want to believe it because it actually makes sense. And I think, I think that's how God is too. I think God is logical, God is orderly, and God provides evidence. In fact, even he helped us in our doubt and he showed Peter, right? He said, look at, look at my scars and do not be unbelieving but be believing. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I would comment that I have your book. <clears throat> the quality and the way you deal with literature is not typical for someone with your background. Mm -hmm. This must have been a very, very highly motivating thing for you for the, what, years of, yeah, almost years. years of full-time effort you must have put in. Yeah, it was full-time work for several years and it, it was, for me, it was obsessive because I'd be laying in bed thinking about hominid bones. <laughs> I'd, be, I'd have a thought and flip open a book and, and you know, it was, it was quite the journey. So, and uh, Dr. Sanford was, was, was a great help to really keep me on track. And if, if I had my way, I would have written this book and it would have been 700 pages probably. So, he <laughs> <you> really... <laughs> Thank you. He was a great mentor. I should, I should add my word to you, Chris. It's good to be here and to hear you in Loma Linda. <laughs> I met Chris, or I must confess, I met Chris Roop several years ago at Ridgecrest. And uh, he was just a young fellow. Uh, I didn't know anything about his background, except that he seemed to be under the, the protection and encouragement of Dr. John Sanford. <laughs> And I'll be surprised if any of you here don't know who Sanford is. He's a very well-known, notorious geneticist. And I'd like to reinforce what Chris has ended his presentation today. We have for many earlier years been, been condemned because the world of science has said science disproves what the Bible tells us. Mm -hmm. But now, as you have pointed out, and you've said it just in passing, Chris, but I want to underline it now. Today's science is actually confirming mm -hmm. in an unprecedented way yes. what we have believed. Mm -hmm. Now, what we have believed in the past has not always been right. We have to refine our views. Mm -hmm. But Chris, we welcome you here to Loma Linda. Mm -hmm. I hope your studies here are going well. Yes. And we, we look forward to hearing a lot more of you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for the kind words. I appreciate it. It is a blessing being here. It feels like home already. So, And uh, I don't want to come home too often, because of the, mostly because of the weather. <laughs> well, I love my family, but I, I love the people here, and I love the weather here. Thank you. I. Uh, uh, you can easily judge from what's here this morning mm -hmm. to know that there are quite a lot of gray-haired people like myself mm -hmm. here who, who have been clinging on, <laughs> tenaciously believing that we have not followed cunningly devised fables. Amen. But that's what we are now discovering. And thank you for your work with Dr. Sanford. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the book. And thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Praise God. I say amen. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I hope the further you go into education, the closer to Christ you become. And, and don't lose your enthusiasm for this kind of work. 
another personal question, how easy was it to get that book printed in the first place? And we always hear about peer review. Mm -hmm. Were there people who were trying to prevent its publication? No. No, so we self-published, but we still sent it to a number of scientists, including uh, skeptics. So um, recently, I'm trying to think if I should say this, but I will. Uh, Dr. Richard Leakey has read uh, three, two of our chapters, including a significant portion of our dating methods chapter, and he actually gave a favorable response. And so um, part of that is because he didn't re recognize that we were creationists. I I'm pretty convinced. And uh, so I think that he, he saw that it, we had so many secular citations, and it was credible. And he, of course, was involved in that history. He was able to say, this is accurate. Um, we've also had um, a professor who taught this for many years, paleoanthropology. And he said that he's, too, uh, he's so out of date, he actually admitted to us that he read it. He's really out of, or he, I'm sorry, he didn't want to read it because he flipped through it and started to read it and said, there's a lot of updates I'm just not even aware of. He's, and so he said, I can't even touch this. And, so we've, heard, we've heard, uh, heard great feedback from skeptics who are generally would be hostile towards certainly the, the, the short age geological perspective. And, um, but yeah, so we self-published, that helps, but we've also had creationists review it too, so. Yeah. What are, who's next? I'll, I'll just make a comment. <clears throat> Thank you so much for your work and uh, a very good product you made there. I'll, I was very impressed when I read that book with uh, how well documented it was. And this is what uh, carries a lot of weight, I think, with people. It's, it's not a superficial thing, it's, it's, it's a deep thing. <clears throat> I want to uh, emphasize a point you made, and uh, which I think perhaps we need to emphasize more than we have. Uh, many of us are very aware of the fact that such a contrast between what the newspapers report and what the scientific literature reports. And all you have to do is get into that scientific literature and you'll find that hey, everybody disagrees with everybody else. It's, it's, uh, uh, it, it's not hard. What, somebody gives you a nice one, hey, disprove this. Oh yeah, sure, you go look, you'll find something. I mean, the internet's just a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> We need to be honest with all that we do, of course. And this, uh, but uh, my concern, of course, is the textbooks. And you have emphasized that so much. Uh, perhaps we should be kinder than talking about fake textbooks. Mm -hmm. But uh, the illusion there is real. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, how, what, what can be done at that level uh, is difficult because they have the same problem that newspaper reporters have. Mm. And that is they just take the popular line and spread it. But thank you for your work. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's right. It's, it's really an issue. And it's interesting, for example, Dr. Lee Berger, who discovered Australopithecus sediba and Homo naledi, uh, he, his, his team of research got a lot of funding from National Geographic, the same um, media outlet that also promotes his findings. And, and I tend to agree that a lot of times textbook authors, especially the, especially the general textbook authors, they may not be even experts in the field when they're talking about human evolution. Or if they are, they tend to usually go with the, the mainstream view, which is not necessarily the mainstream view in the experts in the field. It's just the mainstream view in the media, as you, as you know. So. It is an issue, it is a problem, and I agree. We need to go back to the primary sources and, and just do the hard work and think through it carefully. Thinking about the flood, and it's uh, pre-flood or post-flood, uh, how it worked with your bones. Sorry, I didn't hear that. How, how it affected the bones that you're discovering. Pre-flood, post-flood, well, that's, that's easy for what uh, I've researched. Um, most of the findings I discuss at great, in great detail anyway have to do with uh, East African sites and um, also in other places for Neanderthals and Homo erectus and so forth but um, especially in East Africa it's pretty clear to me in fact most all sites that this is definitely post flood and for example in East Africa you're finding all types of African fauna in these in these caves in South, South Africa is, is called karstophography there's lots of caves 
And so in these caves, uh, they find, you know, that's clearly post-flood. And same thing with East Africa. Uh, it's clearly post-flood. I mean, we're finding zebra, antelope, all types of animals that we find today for the most part. So, yeah. Um, are you calling this a second edition? How, how would we refer to this? this so one? we're calling it just um, a second printing. 2019 update were same ISBN number, so it's it's that's how we're we're uh, characterizing it. Well, thank you, Chris. I've never met you before, but we've got to know you through Dr. Geem and presenting chapter by chapter, as you know, in this book. Um, we've gotten to know your great colleague, Dr. John Sanford. He's stood in your place, as you've heard. Mm -hmm. He's lectured in this room, both on a Saturday um, seminar and also during the week to students. And I've had the chance to hear uh, his view as a geneticist, so I appreciate that. Now, I don't want to step out of my expertise, mm -hmm. which is paleobotany. Mm -hmm. And I grew up in a staunchly religious home very fundamentalist, and I never regret that. I still have that heritage. Uh, with trepidation, I went to Michigan State University to study fossil botany. Mm. And I had one of the world's uh, top experts in fossil botany as my professor. I did get a degree there and finished up. Uh, he knew I was creationist. He was staunchly the the theistic evolutionist. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'd like to comment on Neanderthal. There's a lot of myths, as you know, about all of these various types, Homo and uh, Australopithecus. The literature is just full of speculation. Mm -hmm. And I remember sitting in class in the 1970s, and it was a class in fossil pollen, and we were discussing the Shanidar cave I think that's in uh, modern Iraq, perhaps. I'm not sure which mm -hmm. country. I think it's in mm -hmm. Iraq today. Shanidar was the famous site for Neanderthal mm -hmm. um, and burials mm -hmm. in situ. Bur definitely, they were buried there in the cave. The extrapolation that he was fighting against is the idea that um, the Neanderthal type were burying their dead with religious ceremonies and the proof was that they brought in flowers and they put flowers on the skeletons. So my professor said, I've checked into it and well good, we can illustrate here. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> um, they, they brought flowers in and the proof was the pollen. Now, beyond that, they had no petals, no stems, no roots, um, no, nothing that went normally with flowers, just pollen. And the pollen was of desert types. Now, you wouldn't expect Neanderthals maybe to grow their own flower gardens. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no evidence of that. But my professor got me to thinking, as a creationist, you know, there's one way to explain it, and caves always have airflow, wind. They all have an entrance and an exit. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the exit is at a diff far different place, hundreds of feet from the entrance. And there's always air, and sometimes it pumps it almost like a vacuum pump. And when air is flowing certain times a year, the pollen is in the air. Mm -hmm. And so you could have pollen in caves yes. with fossil burials and explain it naturalistically. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying this is actually the best explanation, but it opened up my, my mind to the idea that there are alternate explanations, and there's a lot of myths based on one explanation. And I'd yes. like to hear your comment on I that. I think that's, I mean, I wouldn't cite that as good evidence that Neanderthals were, were intellectually and fully human. I think yeah. we have other much we have other evidence we have much yeah so, but I agree with you although I, so I don't really know I don't know if it came in um, or it was it was grave goods but there are other sites where they experts in the field do acknowledge there were grave goods 
Yeah. And, and I think half of the 500 sites, uh, around half, are actually considered burial sites. Right. So they'd bury their dead. Um, to your point, that's right. You know, we need to think ab about both possibilities there. And uh, good Thank question. You. Yeah. Good. Appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, if you want. So this is just uh, some Neanderthal artifacts. And some have argued they didn't belong to Neanderthals because it looked too sophisticated. But a uh, recent paper in Nature that I looked at, actually they're saying it, it does appear to be a Neanderthal site. So we do find evidence of, of instruments, of figurines, and um, just elaborate burial sites, grave goods. And um, just the fact that they bury their dead alone suggests they, they had a belief in the afterlife or that's really the primary reason why we bury our dead, right? Yeah. So the, the evidence now for Neanderthals is, is I, I think it's one of the most confident things as creationists we can say, that Neanderthals are homo, homo sapiens. And yeah. um, while I have the floor, um, is there any evidence of Neanderthals uh, developing musical instruments or playing music? Or I, I noticed that one bone has clearly cut holes in it. Is that a musical instrument? That's what they're claiming. And some have said that it just could be uh, uh, perforations for, or caused by uh, hyenas. But the thing is, is uh, people that understand the musical, uh, the note system say that actually it, the, the placement of the holes, and there's other examples, uh, suggest that they actually could play nice music. And people have reconstructed it and have made pleasant melodies. You can go on YouTube and check it out. So, um, but again, the, the, the culture inventory is now so extensive, even with cosmetics and jewelry, that it's not surprising that they could do this. Um, so. Mm -hmm. This is a personal question. I just, just received my um, test results from 23andMe. And uh, uh, it basically said that I, my, my DNA matching with a Neanderthal is higher than 97% of everyone who's taken 23andMe. I don't know what that means, mm -hmm. but my question is, okay, I understand. I haven't read your book yet, but I definitely will. You're basically saying like Neanderthal came on after creation, right? So first I'll start with what evolutionists believe, right? right. So paleontologists, they believe that Homo erectus um, left Africa sometime between around two million years ago to as recent as maybe uh, a million years ago, around there, they exited Africa. And they think there's more than one exit from Africa. Right. And they basically uh, evolved into archaic hominids. And that would include creatures like Homo heidelbergensis, Homo neanderthalensis, uh, Denisovans. And so they would say that, and they've always said this for years, that they, were, they came before Homo sapiens. Correct. And, but they've come a long ways from the original claim. The original claim was that this is very apish. Now they say, no, this is essentially human to the point where many are now saying we should just call it Homo sapiens. So they've come a long ways. Um, but the biblical perspective is different because uh, I believe Genesis is written as a historical narrative. So I would say this is not just uh, symbolic. It's not written as in the style of Hebrew poetry. So I accept it as history. Therefore, um, from the biblical framework, we would say, no, they are post-flood descendants, um, probably post-Babel or, or pre-Babel, but basically from the time period from the, the, the flood to the end of the flood to uh, soon after the Tower of Babel is, is probably when they had dispersed and, and occupied much of uh, Europe. And mm -hmm. So if they broke off, they split off at that point, with the number of years we're looking at, they would have had time to develop distinct uh, anatomical differences, you know, the shape of the skull and a few other things. Well, yeah, and, and that's, that's a great point. And so, yes, and I think we find a number of, of Homo sapiens skulls, in fact, that do have similar features. In fact, even experts in the field uh, struggle to kind of, they say, well, is this Neanderthal? It, it dates too recent to be Neanderthal sometimes. They, you know, so they, they actually can't just draw a line and say, this is Neanderthal, this is human. There's, a, there's a, an array of, of overlap. Um, but yes, uh, so we do think that you can form th that type of... Uh, those type of distinct distinctives. Um, and here's an interesting point. When they sequenced the Neanderthal genome, they found evidence of intensive inbreeding. So they say that their fitness based on their genome would be about 40% lower than, than modern humans. And when we were writing our book, before we even found those papers, we predicted that a lot of these nomadic people groups, because they seem to be nomadic people groups with small tribes and lived in isolation, 
in that circumstance, you'd expect uh, harmful mutations or deleterious mutations would go to fixation quickly because they're small population sizes and if they're inbred for a number of generations. So we think in, in, a, f in a few generations, you can have uh, the fixation of deleterious mutations. You can have uh, developmental disorders become fixed in the population. A real quick question. Does this, I, I'm, I'm kind of a, I'm a layman here. I'm not a scientist. I'm just curious. I've been curious all my life about these kind of things. As far as creation goes, I'm not trying to nail down a date, mm -hmm. but with, when the dust settles, are we looking about a much earlier creation or a later creation or, you know, the church has been dealing with the 6,000 year theory yeah. and I know all about that, but it, and I've never felt comfortable with that. But where, where do you feel we are in this? Well, this is where it goes back to how do you interpret the early chapters in Genesis? And I'm, I'm, uh, I'm confident in what I've, what I've studied that it is historical narrative. And if it's historical narrative, then that means it's not just metaphorical people in the genealogies. Most Christians would say, I thought that was me. Most Christians would say, for example, uh, that Genesis chapter 12, talking about Abraham as a historical figure. But then they kind of have this arbitrary point where they say, but yet Abraham's, uh, you know, those who came before him, like Terah, his father, suddenly become, at some point, become metaphor. And so I, I don't think so. I think the genealogies are real people. And interestingly enough, the genealogies, even if you had gaps, it, it doesn't really work because they give the exact age at which they gave birth to their children. So there's a continuous line from, really from uh, the Genesis 5 genealogies all the way back to Adam. And we know Abraham lived uh, about 4,000 years ago. So I think the timeline is pretty, is pretty tight there. So I do believe in the, the, the traditional biblical perspective of six ordinary days in a, in a young earth. Well, Jim, what it really is, is you're just subhuman. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. Um, <clears throat> some years ago, we had a student who, whose skull was indistinguishable from Neanderthal. <laughs> he, he was very normal and a good student, but anyway, he was he, he were exactly like a Neanderthal. Mm -hmm. He was a good sport. He'd joke about it. That's right. Yep, we find, we find homo sapiens specimens that have pronounced brow ridges, reduced chins, uh, elongated skulls. So um, we, I think we've underestimated the variation that's possible in the human form, especially if you add on pathologies and inbreeding. Uh, just make, it expands it even more. So. You're describing my humble way. <laughs> 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 I've heard about my humble way here. <laughs> just want to mention with reference to the question of how recent creation was uh, if one goes out and looks at those geologic layers out there <clears throat> there's a tremendous lesson that uh, needs emphasis and uh, I could talk a long time about those things were laid down under conditions that are totally anomalous to what we have at present and they are with conditions that you'd expect for catastrophic conditions. Mm -hmm. And those long ages are very much challenged by significant geological data. Mm -hmm. And I would just mention incredibly widespread layers that you can't believe how widespread and thin they are spread all over the place. Mm -hmm. And uh, secondly, where you have gaps, you have no erosion, paraconformities, and so on. This challenges the commonly believed, I mean, this is so popular idea that, hey, this, these things are millions of years old. There is scientific data out there that challenges that. Yeah, I appreciate your findings of flat gaps and uh, where there's just a contact and, and that's where they put a lot of the deep times in those, those uh, unconformities. So thank you for your research. I have a comment which is a I suppose a uniquely Seventh-day Adventist comment one of our church writers uh, Ellen White made statements about after the flood different races interbreeding and I don't remember exactly the way it's stated but uh, some people are very critical of, of that but I think she was actually <coughs> talking about what we now know Neanderthals and all these you know inter interbreeding and so Makes perfectly good sense. That's right. I do have one question of my own, and that is, uh, 
Uh, recently I read, and I, unfortunately I did not have time to go into the rationale behind it, uh, that some creationists have argued that Naledi is actually an ape. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you uh, have seen those arguments and if you have any uh, comments about their validity. Yeah, I actually went to um, a conference with other uh, like-minded creationists and we had a discussion, of, uh, uh, a friendly debate, if you will, about the, these findings. And um, so I don't know if I have any of the pictures of the key bones that were found. Um, so here's an example. I, my case is that it's, I, in this case, I do agree with the evolutionists. They attribute it to the genus Homo, which means human. Uh, Lee Berger, the discoverer, calls it almost human. My, I differ on that. I say, no, it's not almost human. <laughs> it's pretty arbitrary where you say, what's the, where's the line between almost human and totally human? You know? So he, he says it's almost human. Um, I agree, it's, it's, though it's, it's not just almost human, though it's fully human. It's homo sapien. And other experts in the field have even said that it appears to just be an, an inbred homo erectus, which again, uh, would be a homo sapien. But here's the, how you address it. You have to look at the, most, the best preserved bones the best preserved bones that have the diagnostic features intact so you can actually tell apart the ape bones from the human bones uh, if, if there is a mixture. And so far, the best preserved bones that are um, intact are, from my position, from when I've looked at all these bones over the years, it's clearly human, the bones that are actually well preserved. And the skulls, by the way, are very fragmentary, but even the skulls, they've done endocast scans, and so they've, they've been able to show that even the brain appears to be human and not ape. Um, but look at the jawbone on, the, on your left here. That's uh, a very complete uh, lower mandible of Homo naledi. And here's uh, an undisputed Neanderthal, I'm sorry, <laughs> not Neanderthal, an undisputed Australopithecus jawbone. And so you can see that the, the difference, this is, a, which I would consider this ape. And so it's very different. This looks very human. And I don't know if there's any people who are uh, dentists here or not, but um, you'd probably agree this is a this is a human. Um, one, one thing is that, uh, so. is that instead of a perfect U on the right hand side where it's, uh, the teeth are parallel on either side, yes. this is kind of more arched and doesn't actually completely come to a parallel. That's right. And in the book, in the update, I actually have pictures now and I show human teeth compared to uh, Australopith teeth so you can actually see, for comparative purposes, you can see uh, the, the striking difference between the ape. Uh, so, and also look at the hand bone of Naledi. Here's one of the diagnostic features of human hands. And when you look at enough of these, you can instantly say, that's a human hand. And, and here's one of the ways that you can tell is that you have a very long thumb in proportion to uh, shorter fingers. And so that's unique to humans. It gives us our ability to do what they call pad to pad or tip to tip precision gripping. And uh, so, Apes, though, if you look at all primates, they have a very short, this, by the way, this is, this is modern human, this is Naledi. I don't have an ape on here, but um, I show pictures in the book of that as well. And you can see, though, this is clearly a human hand, and even the experts in the field describe this as remarkably human. Um, another well-preserved specimen of Naledi, look at the foot. The foot of Naledi, you can tell, based on certain features of the articulation, configure the, the, um, how, how these bo bones are, are basically fastened together here and also how the, the large toe is in line with the other four toes. All experts in the agree, uh, agree with this very obvious visual comparison that uh, the foot of Homo naledi is virtually indistinguishable from modern human feet. Very different from the ape foot with a divergent hollux, which is like the opposable thumb on their foot. So this is, uh, this is clearly a human foot. And so when you look at the best preserved bones, uh, to me it's pretty clear. Now I'm not saying that it's not possible that there might be human bones in that, I'm sorry, there might not be, there might be ape bones in that cave, in the Denaletti chamber, for example, or the Lissetti chamber, which is more recent finding. Uh, but so far, we just haven't uh, found well-preserved bones to know for sure if there's any ape bones. But there very well could be. But so far, what they're calling Naledi is human. Good question. something very, hap very uh, interesting happening in science. I've been doing a lot of video watching. Theistic evolutionist, I'll, I'll mention that next, 
a lot of uh, evolution scientists now, we've been learning in Dr. Gein's class, they're starting to question the very foundations of what they thought evolution was. And they're saying that the more evidence we get, the more it looks like their explanation is not working. Mm -hmm. And they're looking for better explanations. And so they're trying to look for something better. And then we have the theistic evolution or creation has come along. And now, whereas in the world, the evolution is trying to come out to something better, we have the theistic uh, creationist trying to take us back into evolution. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you yeah. know, I, the church is missing a great opportunity with, with the, uh, the uh, scientists really wanting to know something different that will work, yeah. and then church trying to drag them back to Darwin. Yes. And it's a very interesting juxtaposition. Yes, I, I actually really agree with that. There's, the church has a unique opportunity to really take advantage of all these new findings, especially for modern genetics, which is a very strong biblical confirmation. We need to just get back to the basics and, and uh, you know, and that, that, I think a lot of it has to do with just people just not doing the work, not doing the research, and, and, and trusting too much in man's ideas about the past. Thanks for the comment. Years ago in Peru, I was looking for the perfect skull just to have in my study. Mm -hmm. And I found perfect skulls, the teeth slightly worn down, perhaps from grain and their grain and their rock uh, grinders. But looking at your pictures today does not reflect my granddaughter's orthodontist. He's moving teeth like you would not believe. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so now that you've written the book, you've had some time for discussions and people to read the book and get some feedback, and now you've made an update. Mm -hmm. But you'd mentioned like before, maybe you would made it 700 pages. But say going forward in the future, what kind of things would you see that you maybe hadn't included in the book at this point because maybe you hadn't gone deep enough into the literature or there may be literature wasn't as uh, researched on certain things. What kind of things would you want to target in the future for updates or revisions or, or things that you would like to see that you could mm -hmm. dig into more? That's a good question. Um, I think the best way I can answer that is as I learn more and find more and more supporting evidence, I want it to go back into the book. But you can't just force it into <coughs> an, an already uh, cohesive uh, chapter, so it's hard to just rewrite everything all the time. So one of the, just based on how I operate, I, I always want to include all the supporting evidence, but you just can't do it. So I think that's a challenge for me, is to recognize that what I have is, is strong and I don't need to keep just adding and changing things, just be happy with what you have. Um, but, but at some point I'd love to give an up, you know, I'd love to keep updating this every, every few years. And when they find new discoveries, which they just found a new discovery, I'd, I, I wish I had the time to dive into it and supply, if not new chapters, at least add it to our website for, for an update. So we do have a website, contestedbones.org, and we're trying to keep updates posted there. Um, but right now, I'm at Loma Linda as a graduate student <laughs> studying geology, so that's my priority. So I'm putting, putting a lot of this aside for now. I'm, I'm enjoying speaking and talking about it, but I'm focusing on geology right now. But I want to return to this topic in the future. Just might mention, uh we're talking about this uh, conflict between uh, theistic evolution and creation. Uh, some 50 years ago, uh, Leonard was back there and I uh, were guests of the uh, state of California at a public hearing uh, in Sacramento. Oh, the question was whether or not creation could be included in the textbooks in California. And uh, I was shocked. I don't know how Leonard felt about it. Uh, we were not just fighting science as, uh, versus uh, creationists. Three of Christian pastors got up there in defense of evolution. This was a new shock to me. Hey, 
uh, where, what's going on here? Well, uh, we're looking into this now, and uh, uh, it's, it's a, uh, a very widespread challenge we have. It is. It is. It's strange to think we, we, have, we, have, we really need to reform the church and, and get back to... I just mentioned what one of them said. He said, I lay every belief, every doctrine on the line to be accepted or rejected according to the findings of the physical sciences. He yeah. said that with some passion. <laughs> and the interesting thing about that too is it's, they call it the physical science, but really it's an interpretation of evidence based on a, a worldview filter, namely the evolutionary view of history, not science. So they, a lot of times they do try to equate it as science versus faith, but as we know and as Dr. Brand knows, it's, it's really uh, an interpretation of evidence, again, based on historical presuppositions. And so we need to reframe the argument. It's not science versus faith. It's, it's the evolutionary view of history, which is narrated by scientists and constantly being revised, versus the biblical view of history. And we're all, what we're all trying to do is interpret the evidence that we all share in, in the present and all can, have, all have, can have access to. Well, I want to thank you very much for coming. Uh, thank you. Thank you all. I enjoyed this. And uh, don't remember, for, uh, don't forget, excuse me, for, for those who uh, want the update, you put your email uh, there and Chris will get it to you. Uh, also remember that next week we'll be talking about Douglas Axe and uh, uh, three reasons uh, not to believe the evolutionary story uh, that are accessible to the common man.